So, continuing uh, with chapter two of Battle Spaces of Mind. Um, I mentioned before a Wild Bill Donovan. In the previous lecture, we talked a little bit about a Wild Bill Donovan and his relationship to J.P. Morgan, um, his avowed belief in fascism that got him into the inner circle of the Italian fascist military and the German fascist military. Um, Wild Bill Donovan, interestingly, is um, viewed as Britain's man in America. How Wild Bill Donovan learned and was taught intelligence gathering specifically and psychological operations. He was taught this by a British intelligence agent that came to America and actually spied on Americans and created psychological operations to get the United States involved in World War II on behalf of uh, the British uh, Empire. Um, Stevenson is a very interesting fellow. He was also a person who created the concept of, uh, he created a school in Canada working for British military intelligence, which taught dirty tricks. Um, it's interestingly, if you like, Captain America, it had a tower there, a radio transmitter tower that they called Hydra. So I, there's, um, I like when culture catches up with um, this murky intelligence world, but he was viewed as Britain's man in America. He went to Britain, he studied how the British gathered intelligence, conducted their operations. But interestingly, the person under Stevenson, Stevenson's assistant, who was like the immediate um, the immediate um, teacher of Bill Donovan on these topics later was revealed as a Nazi spy. So again, we see all these fascist links with all these um, neuroweapons, psychological operations, total totalitarian viewpoints, as we shall see here. But Bill Donovan was appointed by FDR in July 1941 to lead the Office of the Coordinator of Information. All the intelligence reports before this, uh, the military and its various departments, the Navy the, and the Army, uh, there were only two departments there, the Air Force didn't exist and the Marine Corps as a part of the Navy. Um, they collected their own intelligence and they would rotate. Um, one person, one, per, one day the Army was in charge, the next day the Navy was in charge. Interestingly enough, they had intelligence, intelligence reports warning that the Japanese fleet was heading towards Honolulu, but because of this, this uh, passing off of, of information, the report was lost, and, that, and FDR never re received the warning that the Japanese were on their way to attack Pearl Harbor. <coughs> uh, but anyway, he is head of the Office of the Coordinator of Information. All the intelligence reports are now going to come into him, into his sole hands, and he's going to report to FDR. Um, what the intelligence community is saying. Um, another person involved from a Wall Street lawyer background and a personal friend of Bill Donovan's is a person named John J. McCloy, who was the head of the Army's G2, G2 in the Army. Uh, in the American Army, the intelligence division is known as G2. Um, in the Irish Army, it's also known as G2. Uh, I think there was a British G2 for a while, too, but I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that. Um, John J. McCloy took over the Army psychological operations, which were part of that. In 1946, after the war, uh, Donovan argued for uh, a vast covert uh, intelligence apparatus in the United States of America. So Donovan's giving all these... Um, influences, say, from a Nazi spy to teach an intelligence gathering. Uh, after the war, he's advocating for a, a covert, civilian-led um, intelligence agency, which eventually does become the CIA. In 1946, the Central Intelligence Group, under the leadership of the military, and, and there is a specific reason it was under the leadership of the military, led by General Vandenberg, the military was not on board with the creation of the Central Intelligence Agency from the start. They never wanted a 
a completely separate apparatus with all these murky secret covert operations going on. And they advocated for um, what we basically, we, it's like the National Security Council structure. What we have now in the United States is it's supposed to be a committee of people uh, talking about the issues, all the reports from the intelligence community and coming to a consensus of which way to move forward. But this wasn't that at that time. So to get this, this passed, to get it passed to the military, they had the military in charge in the beginning. And you will see um, how the military and civilian leaders swap out a lot of times. Like even in the NSA, uh, is usually led by a military general, um, while the Central Intelligence Agency is led by a civilian, but sometimes also a general these days. Um, Interestingly, we'll read, we will talk about um, one of the CIA directors later who, at the, during the war, worked in Switzerland on financial espionage for the OSS and was also negotiating uh, with Himmler for uh, a different kind of government in Germany from 1943 forward. All right. Uh, in 1947, the CIA's officially created. What the, um, there was this um, National Security Directive 4A was created that, that year, and this authorized overt psyops, and later, uh, within a few months, they also authorized covert psychological operations. Who was going to run these covert and overt psychological operations? What, in, what they created the Office of Policy Coordination, and this was going to be run by Frank Wisner. Frank Wisner, interestingly, if you like Skull and Bones conspiracy theories, was a Skull and Bones member. Uh, Donovan's family was uh, had members in the Skull and Bones, but he himself was never a member of Skull and Bones, but I'm sure all many of his friends were in the Wall Street world. Uh, actually, the CIA got its name Spooks, like the nickname for CIA agents, Spooks is the nickname for members of the Skull and, Bowl, Skull and Bones, Skull and Bones uh, fraternity. At Yale, they call them spooks. Uh, what happened was most of the senior leadership of the CIA in the early days was comprised of mostly Skull and Bones members. Frank Wisner was a powerful member of this clique. He started uh, a group in Georgetown. Uh, he also was responsible for coordinating with General Gellin in Germany, the former Nazi general who was fighting the communists for the CIA in Germany. Frank Wisner later goes uh, insane. He's hearing all these voices. Um, and, you know, we see this powerful person in psychological operations well taken out probably by another nation's psychological operations. And you can see this again and again. Uh, one issue I do want to go over is uh, just to read some of this account here. This is from um, Simpson's work again. The phrase psychological warfare is reported. Oh, whoops. <laughs> uh, all right, so Simpson again. He contended that the U.S. government, all right, we're talking about an assistant wizard when the State Department was created was Hans Speer, who advocated for martial, martial law. Frank Wisner's, <laughs> one of his assistants from the State Department, is advocating for martial law. And this is what Simpson writes about this Hans Speer, martial law. He contended that the U.S. government should prepare immediately to impose martial law in the United States to guard against defeatism, demoralization, and disorder, if that proved necessary. More urgent in Spears' mind, however, was activation of a strong offensive program designed to overthrow rival regimes. Subversion is the aim of strategic propaganda, Spear wrote. The United States can wage sincere political subversion propaganda against the dictatorial Soviet regime, particularly in the political realm. Planning and preparation for strategic propaganda in a future war must begin now. Thus, by the end of the 1940s, Speer, McGranahan, and other prominent communications research specialists used the pages of Public Opinion Quarterly to call on U.S. security agencies to employ state-of-the-art techniques to facilitate the overthrow of governments of selected foreign countries in a future war. 
the preparations for which should begin immediately. Spears' program included coercive measures, even the imposition of martial law, to ensure that the proposal, to ensure that the U.S. population cooperated. Although Spire, Spear presented his arguments in the form of a proposal, it is today known from the declassified records of the National Security Council that many of the measures he recommended were, in fact, actually underway at the time his article appeared. And that's on page 48 of Science of Coercion by uh, Simpson. So we can see that there's really not, um, if we're, if these governments, these powers that are using, and not necessarily governments, I mean, it can be private powers too, like the city of London interests. When they are engaging in these psychological operations, it is ultimately to control people and men with power that control other people will only lead to despotism. 